Hi, welcome to Barry Nation, where we support the bariatric community with humor, humility, and honesty. You've just tuned into a podcast that welcomes you into a community, a resource center, and a safe place that powers your journey towards personal wellness. Our goal is you leave us today feeling hopeful, inspired, and ready to live your best bariatric life. Hey, Barry Nation, it's April. If you are feeling a little lost, alone, maybe a little scared or worried about an upcoming bariatric procedure, or if you're six months post-op and things are starting to shift and get a little bit more difficult, we understand what that feels like. It's why we created the Barry Nation Membership Community. It's our own app where you can connect with experts in real time almost every single day to ask your questions, get answers in real time, and connect with fellow patients who understand what it means to do the work of weight loss surgery. Join us today in the amazing Barry Nation community by visiting barrynation.mn.co. Invest in yourself and invest in your health. Welcome Barry Nation to another fabulous episode of the podcast. Today we are inviting a brand new guest that we have never had an opportunity to talk to, but we are thrilled to be introducing you to JJ Rodriguez. We met him at the ASMBS conference this year where he blew our minds about exercise and movement after bariatric surgery. So if you have been wondering how much exercise or movement do I need to get in before and after surgery, what's really going to be the most impactful, and just how do I approach this, this conversation is 100% for you. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to JJ. Will you introduce yourself for our audience? Of course. Thanks, April. Um, I look forward to to meeting the Berry Nation audience. So my name is JJ, as April alluded to, I had the privilege of uh, talking at ASMBS, a conference um, that's hosted, and um, give you some background about myself. Um, By training, I'm a clinical exercise physiologist. So I guess by current state though, I'm just a good old manager right now. But uh, uh, I'm in Houston, Texas, and uh, I work for large hospital system, Houston Methodist, and um, I'm one of the managers for our Center for Weight Loss and Bariatric bariatric Surgery. And so started my career as an exercise professional, and I've been in a lot of settings from gyms to, you know, fitness classes to CrossFits to the endurance sports to and and into clinical. And so cardiac rehab settings, PT settings, and then I found myself in the obesity medicine space and weight loss space. And that's where my, I think my passion is relating to exercise. And so um, that's a little bit about myself. I started um, in executive and uh, clinics and teaching people about exercise. And that's where I really noticed large gaps in exercise education. What's perceived out there in social media and what you may think exercise is, and then what actually like the literature says about exercise. And, and so that kind of really spun the education. So for about five years, I taught a ton of classes to a lot of people. And the the whole idea was like, how do I figure out how to make exercise relatable? Because what I learned early on is that no one really likes to exercise. There's actually a very few small percentage of people that like it. And so, you know, if that's not the trigger, then then how can you get people to move more and find it part of your daily routine? So that's a little bit about my path, I guess. (laughs) It was just incredible when when we were sitting in your myth-busting class that, that you were leading. And the things that you were saying about exercise absolutely resonated with, with myself and, and Christine, who I was there with, because I too don't like exercise. I like to move my body, but the thought of exercise comes with a lot of baggage. And when you talked about what you're going to talk to us about today, it absolutely blew my mind. And I think I texted Jason and Natalie right away. And I was like, you guys have got to hear this guy. You have got like, this is going to absolutely blow your mind. So we're just so thankful that that you are such a skilled educator and that you are here to really help us understand how and where movement can benefit us along our bariatric journey. Yeah, of course. It's a fun story to that. You know, no one likes to exercise. So I used to like, when I first started as a clinician, I prescribed exercise. And I, this is the like the conclusion, the aha moment for me. And like 99% of individuals did not do what I said. And so right from the beginning, it was like, this isn't, this isn't going to work. <laughs> and so I actually did an activity in support groups 
and in classes. You know, pre-COVID, there was a lot of in-person and we had a lot of in-person engagement. And so I had them draw it. I don't know where I got the activity from, but it's a, it was a real fun activity. And I'd have them draw a word association. And I did this at ASMBS. And it, it's such a fun game. And so I'd say random words. I'll give you an example. Y'all can play with me, right? If you don't mind, entertain me mm-hmm. for a second. When I say a word, say the first thing that comes to your mind. Like, don't, don't overthink it. Just be very simplistic. It can be inappropriate. You should hear some of the support groups I've, I've hosted. <laughs> uh, so let me give you an example, right? Fire truck. Fire. Help. Heard it. Very good. First thing that comes to mind, banana. Gross. You said banana? Oh, banana. I love bananas. <laughs> Bananas <laughs> <laughs> are my jam. <laughs> Good. All right. Olympics. Medals. Badass. Cool. Exercise. No. Hard. Move. Better. Groove. Okay. This is what I used to do, and I actually had patients draw it. The pictures you would see, if I could show you, would be enlightening because the connotation when you think of exercise is what exactly you mentioned, April, baggage, right? There's a story behind the exercise conundrum that we all face. And and even elite athletes have this. It's not subject to the normal person. There is something hindering them from performing, right? And that's what we think of as, as exercise. Move, you hear things like better, you know, it's you rhymed it with something. So I'm curious, April, do you like dance? Do you like to dance? No? Okay. You just have the, the guy. Okay. So <laughs> when, I, when I say move, I get people saying like moving my box or like move like I'm moving away or something like that. It's completely different. And so I used to have this jingle or I used to have this phrase, exercise is quantified movement. Okay, you take movement and put a value to it and you have exercise. All we've done though in society is made stigmas around exercise and it's tempered our cognition of what we view it and it makes it very hard for us to then begin. And so once I, you know, figuring this out with participants and a lot of individuals of playing a game, it became very clear to me that we needed to reframe it. <laughs> well, right? it's good because when you, when you say movement to me, as someone who had limited mobility at my heaviest weight, the fact that I can now move so much better is it's just that's the first thing that comes to my mind is that I can move better. I can tie my own shoes. I can clip my own toenails. I can put my own socks on. Right. I can do all of the things that I couldn't do before. I park at the farthest spot and walk my way you know, to the building now because I didn't used to do that before. I'd get tired within the first 50 steps. Of right. getting to and from the car and have to take a break walking and those things. So just yeah. the ability to be able to do it now has reframed my entire mindset when it comes to movement. Now, exercise we're still working on, but movement, hey, we can talk good about movement all day long. <laughs> and, but, but that's the beginning, though. In my opinion, that is the beginning of where the conversation should start. And I think a lot of individuals start with exercise with all those things you mentioned, Jay, you know, and mm-hmm. that's, that's really hard. It's really hard to connect with. It's really hard to like relate to, mm-hmm. um, you know, you've reaped the benefits of an awesome procedure and, and awesome doctors. And, 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 and now you're beginning to see things very differently. Like you, like you mentioned, that's a huge win. You know? And um, I know so many of us in the, in this bariatric community, right? We have used, I, I've used exercise as a punishment. I ate something or I did something that went against my diet or whatever it was. And my only like recourse was, well, I have to work this off. I have to exercise. I have to do this. It wasn't out of a joy or a calling. It was out of feeling bad about a decision that I made. Yeah. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that we've purposely chosen movement as one of our pillars in Barry Nation, because it's not about you know, prescribed exercise. It's not necessarily about a time or duration or intensity. It's about how can we move our bodies in meaningful ways that are accessible to us today? Yeah. Not how we used to move, not how we want to move in the future. We just need to move our bodies today in, in these meaningful ways. And it's such a freeing moment when people kind of embrace that understanding of it. And I think it invites them to really ask themselves, well, how do I want to move? How do I enjoy moving? 
what's fun? Because they never were able to ask that before or do it because of their limited mobility. Yeah, it, that's it's a big piece. How you want to move is a, is a very common, like that's one of the things I ask, we used to ask patients. It's like, what exactly do you want out of physical activity? And that's a, a big question because a lot of times I find that they may not no, and because maybe it's you know they've used physical activity as a tool to lose weight or to you know you use the phrase like a, a punishment. I ate too much. I need to exercise it off. And mm-hmm. there's some interesting literature on that that maybe it's not even it doesn't even work that way potentially. And so um, I alluded to this in some of my talks that I give. It's like how many and I'll be like how many of you have actually lost weight doing exercise? There's very few hands. Uh, there's very few hands. And so even um, subjective experience, we've all done this. Every every person's done this, right? You go to the gym and you bust your butt for a week. You decide to make a lifestyle change. You got hyped. You got a new program. Fits you, you like it. And you go and you go do it for consistent. I mean, you put in all the work. And the outcome you expected wasn't what you wanted. And, and I hear that story a lot. And so the question is, what exactly were you looking? And if it was weight loss... Let, let's talk about it. You know, let's talk about why maybe that's not the best view of it. Yep. Well, that's actually a perfect segue because the, the first question we want to ask you is about that. And Jason, I, I have a true or false question for you that, that I'd like you to answer. And I know the answer and, and JJ knows the answer, but okay. Are you ready? Ready. True or false? Exercise will not help bariatric patients lose a significant amount of weight after surgery. I would have to say that's true. JJ, the answer? It's, it's true. It's true, yeah. Okay. I just want to do a full stop here because in my brain and in Jason's brain and the brains of millions of bariatric patients, we think we have to exercise to lose weight. And when you shared this at the ASMBS conference, you broke my brain. And I was like, I need to understand this better. And when you showed the data, exercise is important, movement's important, but it was that significant weight loss. That piece of it was like, oh, this is new. So I think a big piece here, I'm kind of curious. I I don't want to deviate. I may come back to it. But Jason, why do you say that? Because one of the things that we have said in Barry Nation from the beginning of Barry Nation is fitness happens in the gym, weight loss happens in the kitchen. Okay. And so I know that for a, a better part of us being able to sustain a healthier body and to kind of replace the fat that we've lost with muscle to kind of help shore up, you know, some of the composition changes in our bodies, that that is important to do, but at the same time, you're not going to drop 50 pounds, you know, of your first initial, you know, weight, just being in the gym and still eating, you know, however you want. Yeah, I love it. You have a mantra within the, the community. That's so good. Yeah. So I think when we go back to that statement and that question, uh, we have to define significant. And when you look at the literature and the research of this, this is where headlines and research differ. You can get a headline that says exercise helps with weight loss. That's a true statement. But if you read the paper, how much weight loss is specific and what are we calling significant? So papers are, are judged and are based off, uh, they call it power essentially or st- statistical significance. And a lot of times when we see those headlines, we don't double click under to see like what was significant. And when we look at large scoping reviews of exercise isolated with weight loss, very non-surgical weight loss, significant is defined by six pounds. And six pounds in most of these studies happen over months. And so in the review, and this is some of the literature I presented, I, you know, I present to patients, you know, we talk about six to 10 pounds max isolated exercise, and it's over the course of a year. The reality is it's like a pound a month, but it's considered statistically significant for the purposes of the study. And so I think a lot of times when we extrapolate or we don't read the details of like how much was lost, how much was lost in X time frame, those are critically important. And, um, you know, you get a headline that that's kind of deceiving. There's truth in it, but it's also not re- relatable to like public domain. So an example, like, would you want to, bust your butt for a year or six months to lose six pounds. 
Like that's not significant to, to anyone. And so that's, that's a big key piece. Now, I guess why, why, why it doesn't occur, man, there's a lot of reasons, but I think the, the, the prime reason is we don't burn as much as you may think. <laughs> uh, we don't burn as much calories as you may think. And, and your exercise session can't compete with a smoothie. I would say even a fruit, even a smoothie. <laughs> and so there's a simple, you know, we all hear calories in, calories out. And that's, that's kind of the basis formula. And, and to, to the degree it is true, there's a lot of variables that'll, that can hinder it and make it difficult for others. But it's just hard to outburn calories so that the mantra you have about the kitchen and the, the, the gym, and that's very true. And I know, Jason, in, in Very Nation, we talk about this all the time because people very much want to equate, right? Like, I'm going to move, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to do this, and it's going to, right, it's going to power my bariatric journey. You and I both experienced something very different. I didn't move for basically the first three years of, of my bariatric journey. I think you were kind of the same. And I lost a significant amount of weight. So that helped me prove that like there is this disconnect. Exercise and movement is critically important for the human existence. We're not saying that. But when, right, when we conflate them, it, it almost becomes this source of anger and frustration for us because we think we should be getting further because we're exercising and we're committed to this and we're doing this. And it absolutely could be helping you feel better. But when it comes to the weight that you're losing, the, the surgery is doing that, right? The metabolic surgery has, has taken over. And I know you and I have both gotten to this place where we really have been able to separate, okay, right? Fitness happens in the gym, movement, whatever. It's all about what we eat and, and, and how we choose to eat it that is making the, the biggest impact on our, on our diet. And I know you've discovered that too, Jason. Yeah. No, and, well, and one of the hardest things about somebody on their bariatric journey and including the gym too early or kind of in, in a kind of in between where they're still losing weight, they can be doing regular weigh-ins. And if they're going to the gym and hitting weights and doing other things, the first thing they're going to see is, is, oh, no, I'm up on the scale five pounds. I've been going to the gym, hitting it hard for the past three, four weeks. And now it's time for me to weigh again. And the scale's up. Like, I'm doing all this movement. Now what the hell? And this is the worst fit. And, like, this is a common thing that I hear in support groups. And, and, and th- let's, let me, let me ca- can I elaborate on this? Because this is one that's like a myth, right? <laughs> and so um, this is one that's very tricky because I see clinicians fall into this trap uh, quite often too. Um, and I had a whole section about myth busting on this because it's important that as clinicians, we use the right words. And this goes into, I started exercising and I gained weight. The common thing that I hear clinicians, the biggest mistake I hear them say and make is that it's due to muscle. And I could give a whole lecture on muscle, uh, but the reality is muscle is very, very difficult to grow. More than likely, it is not due to muscle. What happens here though, why it's so important that we level set on exercise and, and these, these fundamental principles is because, again, we create false narratives, we create false hope for, for ourselves and for our patients if we're saying, you know, oh, it's due to muscle, and then a week later, we find out we didn't, you do, you do a body composition and you didn't gain any muscle. Maybe. You know, the, the body fat percentage hasn't gone down. And I've done plenty of body composition tests to know that it just doesn't fluctuate. It'll go up and then it'll go back down and go up and down and up and down. So, you know, what is it caused by that? Why do I have an increase? You know, there's a couple things to think about. One, it's very possible that you begin to physical exercise and then overeat. Overcompensation is very common, right? Oh, that workout kicked my butt, sweating. I'm going to have a meal. That meal just was way too many. Again, we didn't burn as much as you may, you may think. They always tell patients, like, for your workout routine, the, the two most important meals is pre and post, but the pre and post is not drastic. Like, it's a serving. It's not like a whole meal necessarily. So, you know, those are important things uh, to keep in mind. For new workout indiv- individuals that are just starting a workout routine, there is inflammation that will occur in the body. Um, so there is uh, um, swelling that can occur, um, and so it could be due to hydration. You'll see this very easily if you if you have like a simple body composition scale, and you just do it at your house, or even just weigh yourself before and after your workouts, 
And then the next morning, you see fluctuations that range from anywhere from two to five, five pounds. Obviously, this is not due to weight loss. And so, you know, those are real key pivot, uh, pivotal things. I always tell patients, we need to look at weight in a trend line over time. You can't look at the individual weight point because it's going to fluctuate so much. And so the trend line overall in the data, is it negative? And if so, over months, then it's positive, right? You can't take the one exercise routine where you bounced up as like exercise is not helping um, me overall. And, and that's really hard to, to digest, though, for, for a lot of individuals because you put in the work, you expect to see it go down. And some of these realities with exercise, like the moment we can begin to release those, you begin to have a better relationship with, with physical activity. But man, I tell you, even personally, it's very difficult to move out of that mind trap. And we hear these all the time in, in the community, which is why I was so mind blown at ASMBS. And that's why I was so excited to have this conversation with you because we have carried these things. We read the headlines. We don't really go into depth or we don't understand how to read these studies. And we just assume that what that headline says is correct. But in actuality, it's it's partially correct, right? We're we're making this entire narrative out of this small piece that is true. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think, you know, what comes to our mind during this conversation, it's like, okay, so weight, you know, exercising isn't going to equate in any significant weight loss for me as a bariatric patient. So why exercise at all? Right? Like what why do it? Yeah. Or why move at all? Yeah. So the body is meant to move. Let me give you an example. If you sit for a prolonged period of time, I'm like, I'm like right now, I can tell you myself right now, I'm <laughs> sitting all day today at his desk. <laughs> what begins to happen? Like, what, how do you feel? Yeah, you know, no, I mean, I'm, I'm stiff. My, my butt hurts. My legs are kind of starting to ache, right? I just like, okay. I'm feeling like I just want to do this. Yeah, that's not because of you. That's because you haven't moved. And I like to tell patients that, our body gives us these signals to get up and move. And uh, we become so accustomed to just being in norm with these signals. Oh, this is because of my age. Oh, this is because I, I'm, I'm overweight. Oh, this is because I have whatever disease state. In reality, that's not necessarily, necessarily true. As when we're young, we're able to do some really cool things. I do a, a biomechanics little class where you see the patients and I show them a baby. And if you ever seen a baby play, they get into low squat positions. You know what I'm talking about? It's just a low squat. And I, I tell I, I tell patients and I used to tell people, I still tell people, how often do you get in that position after you graduate college? Never. So there's a principle with muscular skeletal systems. If you don't move it, you lose, lose it. it. Muscles work very similarly. Um, it's function. So the act that you become sedentary over a prolonged period of time is reason for pain and dysfunction. Not all the time, but majority of the time is a is a, the prime driver for this muscle dysfunction uh, and pain versus whatever the, the, the case is. You can go to scenarios in countries that are maybe not as developed or they have uh, a very hardworking culture. You'll find that uh, they move very differently than us, even with pain. So the function is just very different. And so there's a very big move it or lose it. So you ask why exercise? The prime reason is move it or lose it. Okay, the quality of life from functioning is the prime reason we should move. But then that shapes the narrative of what, what I like to be doing. Example, getting out of the car, getting off the toilet, getting off the bed. All those require a squat. The squat is not a uh, uh, challenging thing. It's a challenging word. It's a scary word if you're in the gym. But you do it every day in order for us to get out of the chair biomechanically, that is a squat. So you need to practice it. And so reframing all of those movements is very pivotal in saying, okay, function. Okay, I need to do a squat, which is this. Let me load it up. Let me add some weight. So that way my joints and muscular system can do this over time. And so now you have a question of function, move it or lose it. And then you can make exercise impactful. Okay, I want to lift my kid above my head. I, have, I want to put things on the shelf. Then we need to do shoulder presses. You know, you need to add weight for the function of that. And you keep it and view it in that framing. And then you have a different discussion about exercise. I think that's the prime way we should look at it. Number one, secondarily reason to exercise is just overall disease state. Really, really well published now we know exercise plays a facet in almost every 
disease state except weight loss. <laughs> the, the one thing that you think it should help with, it really doesn't uh, play that big of a factor. But very large still studies when we talk about like diabetes, uh, when we look at uh, cardiovascular disease, and then long-term studies of individuals, what, they, what they'll measure is what they call a hazard ratio or a risk ratio. The percentage of a, an event that could occur to the individual that ends their life or causes a disruption in life. Individuals that are performing physical activity, and we'll, I can define what that is, the total amount, the relative risk ratio drastically declines. And so, you know, you look at it for quality of life, essentially. So function and then quality of life, reducing risk of all-cause mortality, risk that we develop pretty well published for cancer now and, and many, many other things. So those are the things that I, 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 this why we should exercise. And then, then the question is, you know, what's, what's next? Once you check that box off, then it's like, okay, I find most people, they're not satisfied with that. And so then, then it opens up a different discussion. And, and we start to get, it starts to get a little more complicated, but, but that's kind of, that's kind of a foundation level one, why we should exercise. I tell you the riskiest part of it all would be me trying to get in that little squat position. Cause I ain't been in that. See, used to graduate college. She is. I ain't been in that since I started grade school. I don't know what you're like. Mm -hmm. That's no, no thanks. I'm 6'4", 270 pounds, so that is not happening. There ain't no low squat over here because none of y'all can help me get up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's, that, that is the, there is no other tool that we say that that is normal, but we expect that from our bodies. It's very custom. My wife is an orthopedic physical therapist and uh, her specialty is in back pain. And uh, everyone knows this story, right? Uh, the phrases I threw out my back, right? And you never throw out your back doing things that are difficult. You throw out your back like picking up your sock. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like you throw out your back from like the randomest things. The reality is that's a compendium or a compilation of something you it was never strengthened, never used. And then finally, the rubber band snaps, right? From the most random thing. And so that move it or lose it function is real, real imperative. Yeah. And every time we talk about movement or exercise, I, I just become so aware that it, it, it can be a real trigger point in our community. And honestly, Jason, I think about you. When you started your bariatric journey, you could barely walk, right? Like you, you've shared this. So I think it's frustrating for people when they go into this experience and they hear from people, okay, you're going to have to exercise this many days, this many minutes, and this is what you need to do. But you're asking somebody who hasn't been able to walk right. to, yeah. to go from their, you know, their pre-surgical state or their state in that moment to this big, huge thing that they've, you know, never imagined in their life. And. And, and I think it can be intimidating for people and it turns them off from, from movement and they think, oh, I'm never going to be able to do this. And it just shuts them down. Yeah. And I think the power of this conversation is, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. And that if we are really changing our mindset when it comes to movement and we are looking at the functionality of our current body and, and how functional we want to be, it's that move it or lose it mentality. And we focus on starting where we're at. Just like what you said, JJ, we can grow into where we want to go. Because like, Jason, you're inspired to be back at the gym again. And you lost some of that ability previously. Oh, yeah. No, 100%. Like, and, and what you're talking about as far as like keeping all these these kind of movement goals and things on people early in the journey, I, you know, I, I have shared publicly about the fact that I could barely walk. And to tell somebody now, you know, oh, you need to get 10,000 steps in, I'd be like, I can't get 10 steps in without taking a break. What do you mean 10,000 steps? And now I went from doing 10,000 steps a day to that propelling me into wanting to be back in the gym, which I started. And now it's, you know, it, it, you like what you, it, it's a sequence of movements and things that are going to happen over time, but it's never, it's never brought to people's purview like that. Yeah. It's always like, oh, you got to just do all these things and you'll be able to do it. You'll lose all this weight. It'll be great. Have a good time. Like they, they kind of, the, the movement aspect and why the movement aspect is important is as undersold as the mental aspect of this journey. Like those are the two things that they don't really take time to fully explain. And those are the two biggest things that people have as hurdles in their journey is getting over the mental aspect of the hurdles that we have, as well as, you know, why movement is important and what movement actually looks like. Right. 
it should always be goal based and never prescription based. And if it's goal based, movement could be getting up out of the chair for 10 reps daily, whatever, you know, whatever you're willing to commit to at the time. And then, and then it grows from there, just like you're saying. And so I think we get, you know, your providers, and we get caught up in the, the prescription based and that's, it's, um, it's correct, but it doesn't relate. And so, mm-hmm. and that's, that's a huge, um, that's a huge piece. It is. It's massive. So, so well, it's, it's like it's like taking somebody who just bought hiking boots at REI and telling them, "Oh, well, tomorrow we go forever, so let's go." Yeah, and it's just because I got the boots doesn't mean that I can just go climb, climb Everest. Like, can I get a hill first? Can I get you know something? Can I get a local trail that we go down before we start climbing the big stuff? Yeah, no, it's exactly right. And I think that there is some motivation behind that too. I see this occasionally with patients where you know you get the gear. You go do it and don't meet your expectation. And then that's another kind of ugh, little, little punch in the stomach again. You know, it's <laughs> mm-hmm. so, yeah. So like exercise, it, like let's, I can chat a little about like what's required. Like there's a, the, the prescription, like you mentioned, they, they say go 150. So 150 minutes, 30 minutes, five days a week. Right. That's the, the kind of the, the, this prescription, uh, that comes from large longitudinal studies. When I talked about hazard and ra- uh, risk ratio, when they look at physical activity that's performed and, and quantified, there is huge dips in hazard ratio at different segments of exercise. And so there's a good graph in a publication, a meta-analysis that displays this. And I think the big point to, to note is that physical activity benefits can happen at very little physical activity at light intensity. The hazard ratio drops at a heavy point with 10 minutes of physical activity and even less, but specifically looking at the, the, the literature piece. So, and then let's say you go to 30 minutes. There's another dip in hazard ratio. Okay. Let's say you get to 150 minutes. There's another dip in hazard ratio. And so where this ideal, uh, 150 comes from or 30 minutes, five days a week is when they look at that long term data. The curve for hazard ratio levels out at 150. Mm. So the risk is drastically reduced and doesn't get much better as far as all cause mortality health benefit at 150. What's really interesting is physical activity in the 250 and the 200 range, 200 minutes. That's a lot of exercise, like an hour a day. It doesn't move much more. So the, the, the benefit of health is not much more improved at 250 greater. It actually makes a J shaped curve. It goes back up. And so we see this with extreme endurance athletes. You see this with uh, people that perform a high level of exercise. A lot of times has to do with inflammation, poor recovery that leads to having actual uh, a risk of something occurring again. And so the idea I need to do more and more and more and more is not, is not true at all. It's like do less. And if you really want to optimize it, if you can, sure, get to 150. But we see it's, opt- you know, you're having the lowest risk based off what we know about what occurs. But it's not necessarily necessary, depending on uh, someone's goals. You know what I mean? So I just want to clarify this because I think it is such a profound nugget of like information for us. Ten minutes at light, light activity is the marker for health benefits. No, Ten actually, minutes. It's uh, that we see markers for health benefit at seven k steps. That's actually been looked at. Steps has been looked at. Seven case steps. There's health benefit. Five minute walk has a reduction in anxiety and depression. Um, so again, we'd have to define health benefit. Okay. Right? Where, where you know what exactly? Because it's not weight loss, right? We've already defined that. <laughs> right. If you're, if you're looking to reduce stress, you know, it does a five minute walk help reduce stress. Uh, if you're looking to reduce an example, very clinically example, but blood sugar. You know, if you're looking to reduce blood sugar, if you're a type two diabetic, postprandial after you eat, going on a five minute walk, that's very well published at this point to help reduce mm-hmm. blood sugar. So the goal is like where what you're defining as benefit for yourself, right? For at the, at that time, let's go back to the steps. You know, of, you know, of, of Jason had alluded to. You know, don't climb Mount Everest. Set the goal that makes sense to you. The benefit happens at very little, and then move the marker based off what you want out of it. 
And so I talk, um, get into like, how do you, how do you know? I teach on a concept I'm working with patients. Identifying the goals is so important. You know, identifying what you want is, is probably the most important thing because that, that'll depict what your exercise plan should be. So if you want health benefit, want to live longer, want to function better, I want to uh, split my kids, you know, if that's the status of exercise that, that, that you find that that's what you want out of life at this time, the amount of exercise you have to do is so minimal that it, it's almost, it's, it's negligible. And so I define this as what we call like a health benefit. And there's three, I like to call them buckets that patient can fall into, right? So there's a health bucket. So the amount you have to do to, to stay functionally mobile, it's not a lot, right? Um, to, to reap health benefits. Ideal health, where we see the biggest drop in improving your health, it's that 150, right? We kind of talked about that, but it happens at earlier states too. So, you know, health benefit, 10 minutes, find something that's functionally applicable to you and do that, stick with it. And then, you know, if you feel compelled to get to 150 because you know it's helping in all cause mortality. So that's like bucket one. The second bucket is fitness. And the last bu- bucket's performance. Each one of those buckets has different goals. All right, let me outline a fitness because this happens very often. We conflate the buckets. So I want to tone my arms. That is not a health goal. That is a fitness goal. Okay, when we look at fitness, we're looking at cardiovascular strength, muscular endurance, muscular hypertrophy, speed, agility, body compositions actually in, in that bucket. We're looking at specific things that you're trying to improve. The biggest key, if you have a fitness goal, is specificity. Fitness goal is only predicated on specificity, meaning you want to tone your arms, then you need to work arms, okay? Your sessions on the bike or walking will not tone your arms, right? So you have to get very specific on a plan that helps you get results, kind of like the weight loss thing. You do a plan that you're not getting the results on, why even do it? And so that's a real big piece. The last one, performance. So the verbiage you're going to hear performance. I want to, I want to run a 5k. I want to do a marathon. You know, I want to lift X amount. I want to be stronger than this person, or I want to be faster than my kids. These are performance goals uh, and require progression. So the key here is is progression, meaning you have to progress and over uh, overload your uh, body in the specific nature that allows you to perform. If those principles aren't met and you don't have the right plan, you will not succeed in that. And that's where you get a lot of headbutting of, you know, wanting to hit something and not, not actually getting it. And so I ask this question of patients all the time. It's, it's like, what exactly do you want? Because if it's to tone your arms and, you know, lose some of the, the fat, then that's a fitness goal. Let's get you in the gym and talk about, you know, resistance and overload and how muscle works and how to grow it. But I'm not doing my cardiovascular exercise then. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about getting the results you want to hit and this motivation and this time that you were trying to hit it, right? Because you doing your cardiovascular exercise has no effect on you getting your toned arms or getting strength. So, you know, seeing fitness, seeing health, seeing exercise and what you want out of it is really important in getting the right plan to, to meet the goals that you're trying to achieve. Jason, if you don't mind me asking, like, what do you like to achieve out of the gym? Uh, at this point in time, I'm trying to build back muscle that I once had that I have lost. Uh, I was sitting around a lean muscle mass of 233 pounds when I was not at my heaviest, but when I was pretty heavy. And that's down below uh, 200 pounds now. So I know that there's a lot that I want to rebuild. Uh, shoulders, arms, chest, those things. I've got uh, some blue skin I want to shore up. and. Uh, Really, it is just about building muscle at this point. Perfect. And that's a fitness goal. The specific term is muscle hypertrophy. Your goal is muscle hypertrophy. So your plan needs to be dedicated around how to gain muscle hypertrophy. right? And if you had a plan that didn't get you that, man, that's tough. That's hard to keep up with it because it's a lot of time and hours at the gym. So and, and that type of dialogue and making sure it fits, it matches what you want. If you were working with the trainer and they had you on the treadmill an hour every day, man, that would be a miserable time for you, my friend. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, like th- that's not going to work. So. No, yeah, I actually, uh, with with the person that I am working with, I had told her because I was like, I was doing 15 minutes in the morning first before I started working out on the treadmill just to kind of get steps going and kind of get the blood pumping in those. He was like, knock it down to five. He's like, 15 is too long. He's like, do five, get off and start lifting. I was like, fair enough. Yeah, perfect. No, that's that's a good indication, good trainer. You know, do the bare minimum there because that's not your priority and then move to where the priority is at. Those di- those dialogues, those conversations are so important to to narrow down on. Well, and I could absolutely see how you were talking about people get the buckets confused all the time because you always hear like cardio and this and that, but you really do need to get very clear on what your goal is, and then you need to understand what bucket it belongs in, so you are not wasting the time that you are spending moving on something that's not actually going to help. Right, because who likes exercise? Why would you want to do something that <laughs> we already had this right? discussion? Like, <laughs> and I can well, totally trust see and believe. I spend all my time on the treadmill, staring at the weights, going, "God, I just want to lift. I just want to go right there and sit down and lift the heavy things, pick things up, put things down. I don't want to walk. I'm done." And I would just stare at the clock, at the timer, like, "Why isn't this moving?" Yeah. Oh awesome. my god! Well. And I can see, yeah, it, that leads to total frustration and burnout because you're working hard. You are moving, you're doing things, but you're not seeing the results. And then you're just frustrated and you give up on all of it. And then you're right back to where you were before. Yeah. And I think what you see on like social and things plays a big factor because I had yeah. a, I had an individual email me from the conference and it wasn't about, it was just about like, Hey, I need help with this. It was really kind of cool. Her confusion was regarding structure of her routine. She's mm-hmm. like, she's like, I heard you do cardio before and you do cardio after. It helps with fat loss. And you hear these phrases, right? Do your cardio at the end. Do light cardio at the end. And I, I went, I just went off on a rant email. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the fra- the phrase, what you'll see is like, do cardio at the end. It helps with fat burning. Okay. There's some truth in there. But the, it doesn't apply to everyone. All right. So let's take where the truth is at. If you go to the fringes, let's look at elite bodybuilders and competition, mm-hmm. people that do competitions. That is true. So they want to maintain muscle mass, as much muscle mass as possible, while being in a low caloric deficit. So what do they prioritize? Resistance training, right? They, they, they use their high energy where they're fueled at with lifting heavy weights to keep muscle mass while being in a real low calorie diet. But they still want to taper the calorie diet below so they can get really, really lean. So they throw ca- uh, cardio at the end, light intensity, so they don't burn much, but they burn enough so they're not starving. And so these are principles that are used on the fringes, but don't apply to a lot of times the, the, the normal individual. You know, the, if you're trying to lose weight, the amount of calories you burn doing light cardio at the end of a routine is, is minimal. Like I would, you know, stick with what you enjoy and then really focus in on the kitchen piece, like, like Jason was saying, you know, I just don't think you're going to, you're going to really, if you don't enjoy it, you're going to really bang yourself on the wall when you're expecting, you know, I'm following the strict routine and I'm not seeing the five pound drops that my favorite person does and, or, you know, who I follow does or whatever the case is. Um, yeah. So yeah, those are, those are interesting use cases to hear. It really sounds like now that we understand what these buckets are, right? If, if your goal is, is health, overall health functionality, that health bucket, you are going to see benefits at, at 10 minutes, at five minutes. You are going to see benefits doing something above and beyond what you normally do in your life. And you don't necessarily need that, that coaching aspect of it. You can go for a walk for five minutes, 30 minutes. But if you really want to get specific in that fitness or that performance, right, then you are leading into the expertise of, of trainers and coaches to help you ensure that you are maximizing your movement time. Yep. No, that's exactly right. And I will put an asterisk to the health bucket because sometimes we like to use it as a, as a, oh, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> like, let me just take the dog on a walk. Yes, to take the dog on the walk is helping. It's only helping if it's consistent. Remember, move, exercise happens when it's quantified movement. So I always ask, the one phrase I used to hear all the time is, oh, I garden. I like to garden. And then my follow-up question was, how often do you garden? And it's like once a week. It's like, well, then, then we didn't, you know, uh, once a week of lifting is heading for your back to be thrown, you know, back to be pulled. 
Mm-hmm. You know, your once a week of getting on the ground will not be enough to sustain age longevity. But you have to practice it. And so there's still work in the health bucket. It's just, it needs to be quantified, needs to be uh, consistent in order to maintain it, right? Um, so that, there, that's one thing I pin. <laughs> We will we will pin that too, and it is things that we talk about all the time in, in the Barry Nation membership community, right? We want to move our body consistently. It's one of our pillars, and we strive to live our pillars every day. And movement is one of those pillars. So, being consistent with moving our body is something we we are definitely all all working towards. Yeah, I think one of the uh, pieces too with the bucket concept that really gets patients. And people, individuals, including myself, tripped up is um, moving between buckets. There's like the, I always like to tell individuals, life happens, and when life happens, the very first thing that's going to go away is your personal uh, health. Uh, you're going to put away your sleep routine. You're going to put away your diet routine. You're definitely going to put away your exercise routine because you didn't like it to begin with. <laughs> so you know, th- those are all things that that happen, and so you hear this all the time, you know. Family members, um, stress at work, divorce, death of a family, and then just everything goes out the window. Exercise becomes a second secondary thought. And then your once fitness routine becomes now health. Or, you know, your health routine needs to become fitness. Right. Um, and people toggling between that is is very difficult, I find. That there needs to be some flexibility and grace when it comes to that, because you won't always be able to. There's there's a season for performance, and there's a season for fitness. Health, I think, always has to be maintained, but the other two, it can get tricky because those are things that require your undivided attention and progression to. And sometimes you may not be able to give all of it. So, you know. Wow. Oh my gosh. All right. We have covered a lot in, in this conversation. We're actually going to continue the conversation with JJ specifically around these, the, this bucket concept. And I have some, some questions kind of related to what you were just talking about, moving between the buckets and maybe focusing on two. We're going to, we're going to save that for the bonus portion of the podcast. So if you are a supporter of the Barry Nation podcast on Patreon, you're going to get access to this. And if you would like to get access to it as well, become a monthly supporter. But before we go, JJ, is there one big takeaway that you are hoping people leave this conversation with? You were meant to move. And it's not very easy to figure out how you should do that. I think we need to give ourselves some grace when it comes to figuring out how to do that appropriately. I think we're told how to move. And uh, you may get there, but in reality, you may not. And so being able to really come to a, a good relationship with exercise is going to depend on how you find what you enjoy and then being consistent with it. So explore what that means for you. And then uh, that's probably the biggest thing I would like people to take away because uh, if you had more people kind of like your principles focused on function movement, I think exercise would be an afterthought. And I think we'd we'd have a different conversation. Mm -hmm. We agree. (laughs) JJ, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a phenomenal conversation. We appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Just four years ago, I joined April and Jason on what was then the East to West WLS podcast. I loved their passion to close the gap between bariatric patients and experts in the field. Today, as the Berry Nation podcast, we've recorded over 200 episodes and interviewed countless medical and mental health professionals and patients to help bring the bariatric world together. As a listener of Berry Nation, you've supported and directed this podcast. From giving feedback and asking questions, your voice has helped us create the podcast we know and love. If you enjoy our episodes and want more, your financial support can help make a difference. By joining our Patreon, you help us keep the content coming and improve the quality of our show. Head to BerryNationPodcast.com to become a Patreon supporter today. Thank you for being a part of our podcast.
That wraps up another empowering episode of the Berry Nation podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, keep the conversation going by joining the Berry Nation membership community, where you can attend live support events, access on-demand resources, and find a caring community. Join us at berrynation.mn.co. If you found this podcast valuable, help us produce it by becoming a $5 monthly supporter at berrynationpodcast.com. And just remember, at the end of the day, you've got this, we've got you, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.